look at a few extra verses tonight. We're going to actually look at Matthew chapter 5, verses 23 through 26. I know it's hard for you to believe I'm going to do more than one verse, but uh, these verses all go together. And uh, there really wasn't, I, I tried to parse them apart. I tried to figure out a way to do that, and it really would have been um, probably somewhat stretching it, just one verse and just deal with it. Now, we could have done word studies about it. There's plenty in there, but uh, they go together really because Jesus is talking to his audience particularly about the issue of reconciliation, that when we come to worship, it's important that we not have aught against others and others not have aught against us. That there's, a, that there's a level playing field. It's, it, there's a clear slate, a clean slate. And so that's what he's saying. He's looking at the disciple spirit. Now you remember, we talked already about the disciple spirit related to murder. And the truth is, we discovered several weeks ago, is we're all murderers. Because we all get angry. We talked about the disciple spirit related to murder. We talked about the disciple spirit related to anger last week. Tonight we're going to look at the disciple spirit related to reconciliation. Now you remember, murder, anger, reconciliation, all flows out of what Jesus had to say is, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the Pharisees, scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of God. That means that our righteousness has got to be better than all of that. And those guys kept the rules. They, they, they may have bent them some, but they, they, they worked hard, diligent, to keep the rules and try to keep everybody in line that they knew. And Jesus said, hey, 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 you got to beat all that. That's the standard. The righteousness is, exceeds that. Well, the audience, I'm sure, was looking at him like, well, there's not much hope for us. Well, of course, we know, as Mike prayed, it's the righteousness of Christ that exceeds their righteousness. So let's look at this together, just the verses. Verse 23 says, Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Verse 25, agree with your adversary quickly while you are on the way with him, lest your adversary deliver you to the judge, the judge hand you over to the officer, and you be thrown into prison. You see how it's building there. Moving forward, verse 26, assuredly, this is Jesus speaking, I say to you, you will by no means get out of there till you have paid the last penny or the last price or the last uh, coinage. Now, y'all know that I love to show, I don't agree with all the morals on the show, but Big Bang Theory, some of the characters on there I find absolutely hilarious. If any of you have watched any of those shows, you know that Sheldon has a thing with the, 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 the guy he shares uh, Leonard, that he shares a room with, they in an apartment, he has what is known as the roommate agreement. And it's a whole list of rules and regulations. And all you got to do is just blink wrong at one of the rules and regulations, and you're in trouble with Sheldon. Well, this, this video tonight deals with a, 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 um, a relationship agreement. And I want you to hear this. God in his word says there is a relationship agreement. And his agreement with you and me is we must surrender our will to his will. Anything short of that, anything short of that doesn't make the righteousness. So just watch this. You'll get an idea. And, and uh, there are a number of things that are said in this that I think, yeah, that's not meant to be biblical, but there's some principles in there in that. So just watch this, if you will. Amy. 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 Let's wrap things up out there. Um, good night, Stuart. Good night. 
Thank you, Stewart. The lady take good night. How did you get into my apartment? Wow. Is that the kind of nagging I can expect now that you're my girlfriend? <laughs> Good thing I drew this up. What's that? I present to you the relationship agreement. <laughs> A binding covenant that in its 31 pages enumerates, iterates, and codifies the rights and responsibilities of Sheldon Lee Cooper, here and after known as The Boyfriend, and Amy Farrah Fowler, here and after known as The Girlfriend. It's so romantic. <laughs> Mutual indemnification always is. <laughs> Why don't you start perusing while I set up my notary stamp? Section 5, hand-holding. Hand-holding is only allowed under the following circumstances. A, either party is in danger of falling off a cliff, precipice, or ledge. B, either party is deserving of a hearty handshake after winning a Nobel Prize. C, moral support during flu shots. <laughs> Seems a bit restrictive. Yeah, yeah, feel free to retain a lawyer. <laughs> you know, the truth is, man makes a lot of rules and regulations too. Uh, through the years, I've known folks who have visited churches, and sometimes it's how they dressed or where they sat. And someone sometimes have been so bold to say, you know what? You're just not our kind of people. And that's a, sad, that's a sad commentary. That's saying you just don't quite meet our standard for membership. Well, the truth is, not any of us walking planet Earth meets God's standard for membership in his kingdom apart from those who've trusted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And God goes on to say, Jesus goes on to say in this passage that how we treat each other matters. Reconciliation matters. We are often quick to give a tithe, to give an offering, to stand and pray a prayer and to come to worship and teach the word. But are we, are we right with God? And are we right with our brother or our sister? Now, that's not me saying it. This is what Jesus says in this Matthew 5 passage. And he goes on in, in the rest, other places in the Sermon on the Mount to speak to these issues. But let's, let's move ahead. Word study. We're going to look at three words tonight very quickly. The first word is remember. You, notice, you see what he says there, right? In verse 22. But I, or excuse me, verse 23. So if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember... That your brother has something against you. Remember. The idea of, the idea, remember is the idea of a fixture in the mind or of a mental grasp. It's something that God rem reminds us in our mind, this is what's going on. Now, I don't know about you, but there been a, in my life there's been a number of times where God's reminded me of things and I wanted to put it out of my mind. I don't want to think about that. I'll focus on the hymnal. I'll focus on the pew. I'll focus on the air conditioner. I'll focus on, I'll open my Bible and I'll, I'll read the word. I'll read something here. Because God, I, I don't want to be reminded of what you just showed me. Now probably I'm the only one in the room that ever happens to. But I'll confess that to you because I already have God. God has a way of bringing remembrance to us to creating a fixture in our mind and by the way a fixture means you don't get away from it very easily it means to bear in mind that is recollect by implication to reward or punish it means to be mindful remember come or have in remembrance so the word remember here is significant that Jesus uses this word as he's speaking to his audience the second word is the word reconcile, that you be reconciled. It means to change thoroughly, that is mentally, mentally. To conciliate, to reconcile. It comes from a combination of two words, meaning the two words are dia and lasso. Dia lasso. K 
Okay, two words. The first word is dia, which means through. Lasso, which means to bring together. It, it is two words meaning to the, the channel of an act through and to make a difference to bring about change. So when we reconcile, we are making a decision to move through or past the offense to bring about a change. By the way, the inference there is a positive change, not to make matters worse. Do we all see that? Reconciliation is part of God's plan. And by the way, listen to me carefully, reconciliation is something that only God can do. You and I can try to reconcile things in and of ourselves and our own strength, but you can't make someone reconcile with you. And you, they can't make you reconcile with them. It has to be something, listen, that God births in our hearts. Now, I can't speak about you, but I can speak about myself. There have been a few times, not very many. God help me that, it's not, that there's not ever very many. But there have been a few times where I thought, I don't know that I want to reconcile. I'm mad. I don't think I like how they talk to me. I don't think I like how they treated me. And I think I deserve to be angry with them. Now keep in mind, think of the context of what Jesus has said here. Except your righteousness exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees. Then he moved to murder. Then he moved to anger. And now he's moved to reconciliation. Jesus is pretty serious about this getting along with each other. And not just, listen, getting along with each other, not merely tolerating each other. I've known some folks who tolerate others, but quite frankly, in their heart, they'd already killed them. Just out of anger. It makes to channel and act through and to make a difference about change. The third word is the word adversary. Adversary. An opponent. The idea is the adversary here is a legal term. It's an opponent in a lawsuit. Later on, he's going to talk about court and going to court and those types of things. Specifically, it's the same word that's used for Satan oftentimes as the arch enemy, adversary. Adversary, it comes from a combination again of two words meaning anti, 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 dikos, anti, the general meaning of over against, anti. You know, if you're anti this, you're against something. You're over against, in the presence of or in lieu of. Dikos meaning right or self-evident. That is justice, the principle, a decision, or its execution, judgment, punishment, vengeance. Adversary is someone who works against righteousness, against what's right, who is for vengeance as opposed to against reconciliation. Does that make sense to everybody? That's the context in which Jesus is speaking here. Now let's get going. The text here in some versions begins with so. Some versions start with therefore. It's the same word. It's translated so or it's translated therefore. The word therefore that begins verse 23 points to an important connection with what's before. The following verses... Verses 23 through 26 illustrate the strong words of Jesus in verses 21 through 22. You remember what he talked about in 21 through 22. 21, he's talked about murder. 22, he's talked about anger. So therefore, I'm going to illustrate it in verses 23 through 26 is what's happening in the structure. He says, because of our differing historical context, there is not a one-to-one correspondence in the specific details between the first century and our own. It's hard to see the structure of these verses and what all Jesus was really saying. We're going to make an attempt to do that tonight. However, there are basic abiding, there's that word, right? Abiding principles that transcend all cultures, And are true of all persons, anytime, anywhere, 
and under any circumstances. Jesus gives two illustrations, one in verses 23 and 24, and the second one in verses 25 and 26. If you happen to have your Bibles open, you can see the difference. The first one in 23 through 24 has to do with our financial giving to the Lord. You know, he talked about if you come into worship, you come in to give the money to the Lord, you come to the altar and you remember someone has something against you. Notice he didn't say you had something against someone, but someone has something against you. Ouch. You understand that's even harder. It's one thing for us to come to the altar with our gift and say, you know what, I'm just as mad as I can be about so-and-so and so-and-so. I need to go make that right. He's not saying that. He said if you come to the altar to give and realize somebody's got a problem with you, you need to leave your money, your offering there, and go and make it right. Be reconciled. And by the way, you don't come back and get your offering to give it until that is made right. I don't know what that do to our offerings every week. What do you think? Could, could, could have an impact there. In this scenario, you come to the temple to worship. A component of that worship is giving. It always has been, biblically, and it is as well as today. You place your offering on the altar before the Lord, but then your conscience, your memory, reminds you that your brother or sister has something against you. This is not some unreasonable, listen, not some unreasonable, irrational grudge, but a true and legitimate grievance. It's not that they thought you wore the wrong kind of clothes. It's a legitimate grievance, a legitimate reason. It's not that they, not, they wished you combed your hair different or that you had bad breath the last time you talked with them. It's much more deliberate and specific than that. You have genuinely hurt and wronged your brother or sister. A real problem that needs attention. This is not a matter of just feelings. There, there's, there's way more than feelings. There is a grievance that's taking place here. So what does the Lord expect? Well, I'm glad you asked. In verse 24, verse 24 provides the answer. Leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled with your brother or sister. Then come and offer your gift. And there's an emphasis there is added there. Then, do it. You cannot worship God with integrity without having a clear conscience and right relationships with your brothers and sisters. I have to tell you, one of, and I, I, I can't tell you I've studied it exclusively or in great depth over years and years and years, but one of the qualities that I continue to run across when God brings a revival to a church, when God brings a revival to his people, one of the qualities that always shows up is reconciliation between people. And it's, it's not going, it, it's going to folks saying, you know what, I, I want to ask you to forgive me because I have wronged you. It's organic. You know what I mean by organic? It's not manipulated. It's not planned. It's not a, a place in the invitation where your pastor says, Oh, by the way, if you have all against a brother or sister here in the room, I want to encourage you to get up right now, and would you just go to them and make it right? Now, I've done that, and I've had people respond to that. But real revival is something the Holy Spirit of God moves into a congregation, and people just go and they do that. It's not part of a menu that the pastor lays out and, and says, let me invite you to go and make it right with someone. That, that's one of the qualities I see consistently in real revivals that have taken place in history. Now, why would that be? That's because God takes our relationships with each other and with him serious. God says we're to love him, but that we're also to love one another. And you've all heard the illustration, like a cross. 
It's hard to be right on this plane with us and God if we're not right on this plane with each other. You see, we want to ignore all this. We want to say, just you and me, God. It's just you and me. Just you and me. Just forget all this. Just you and me. God says, 1 John tells us, how can you say you love God if you can't love the people you look at? That's, that's my paraphrase of it. That's what 1 John talks about. It is foolish and hypocritical to even try. Sinclair B. Ferguson is right. Here's what he says. Jesus recognizes that our relationship with God is primary. But we always appear before God as those related, rightly or wrongly, to our fellow men. What we are before God involves how we are related to others. I don't know about you, but when I read that, I thought, ouch. Ouch. What does that say? You can't be right with God without being right with your fellow man. Now, I know, theologically, we're covered. It is finished. We're covered by the blood. But listen, as as Paul said, meganoito, he said, God forbid that we would sin so that grace may abound. Well, God, it doesn't really matter what I do with them. It's what I do with you. Well, God's saying what you do with me is what you do with them. Those things matter. Reconciliation. Now listen, there are things going on in our world we don't really want to be reconciled with these people because they've made us mad. They have hurt our feelings. And God said, so? So? What did you do to my son? You don't think you hurt my feelings by how you treated my son? Last time I looked, I don't know any of us have been crucified. I don't know any of us have been scourged. I don't know any of us have had our blood, our beards plucked out, our hair pulled out. So when we start complaining to God about, God, I really don't want to be reconciled with this person. I'm mad and I deserve to be mad. I'm not sure God didn't say, well, so. Get over it. I had to get over how you treated my son. And I did because I loved you that much. Does that make sense to everybody? I don't know about you, that's sobering to me. Now, you understand, we we all want to retain our right to be mad about some things. And to be hurt about some things. But listen, we all need to thank God that God didn't retain his right to be mad at us. And God didn't decide to retain his right to be hurt over how we treated his son. So, well, that's God. Are we not supposed to be godly? I'm just saying. And I'm not trying to be smart up here. I'm just saying it's it's too easy for us to to decide and to manipulate. I don't want to be reconciled. And God says you got to be. To be right with me, you got to be. D.A. Carson, who's another theologian, is even more direct when he says this. Forget the worship service and be reconciled to your brother. And only then worship God. Men love to substitute ceremony for integrity, purity, and love. But Jesus will have none of it. We want to say to God, look how how religious I am. Listen to how I pray. Look at how much I've given. Look at where I serve. In your church. God's not impressed with any of that. He wants us to be right with each other. The Bible is clear that God is concerned 
with more than the external giving. He is concerned with the heart of the person who gives. 2 Corinthians 9, 7 teaches us God loves a cheerful giver. Now, I've seen certain things in bulletins. Sometimes it said God loves a cheerful giver, but he'll, be, he'll gladly receive from a grump. Well, that's kind of taking it out of context. He's not talking about your grumpiness here. It's talking about your thrill to give to God anything, but certainly what we should. Matthew 5.24 adds that God loves a giver with a clear conscience. That's what he's saying there in Matthew 5. And Matthew 5.9 tells us that citizens of the kingdom are what? Remember? Peacemakers. Oh, we're back to that again, Don. Yes, we are. You can't hardly get away from the Beatitudes. Remember, remember, Jesus begins the Sermon on the Mount by giving us these qualities of the citizen of the kingdom. Doesn't mean being grumpy or being unreconciled or being angry or being a murderer. Our text before us calls us to be peacemakers before we worship, specifically before we worship God with our giving. Otherwise, our gifts mean nothing as far as God is concerned. Jesus' second illustration begins in verse 25. Interestingly, the word brother, remember he talked about your brother or sister up there in verse 23? The word brother is replaced by the word accuser or adversary. Did you catch that that shifted there? The issue, however, is similar. You find yourself at odds with another person. They're now an adversary. They're not a brother or sister. They're an adversary. The nature of the disagreement is of such severity that it appears that the courts must get involved. And we've all seen that from time to time. This has all the components of a civil case, something Paul addresses in 1 Corinthians 6 in a manner similar to what Jesus does here. Now, a key biblical principle undergirds what Jesus is teaching us. We find it in Romans 12, 18, when he says, If possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. You understand God's not moved by, but Lord, you, 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 you don't understand how they treated me. Can you hear God saying, well, so? Now, I don't know that God says so. That's what I hear him saying. So? Because he begins this passage by saying, therefore, therefore. From this instruction in the context of Matthew 5, 25 through 26, John Piper makes two helpful observations. We are only responsible for what others hold against us when it is owing to real sin or blundering on our part. In other words, are they offended? Is there something they've got against us because of our sin, because of our attitude, because of something that we have done? Piper also says we're responsible to pursue, pursue reconciliation, but live with the pain if it does not succeed. Let me tell you, the pain of reconciliation is horrible, of of something unreconciled is horrible. You've done everything you can do. You've said everything you can say. You are at the end of your rope. There's nothing else you can say and nothing else you can do. That doesn't mean we don't try to reconcile. Doesn't mean we give up. Because God never gave up on us, did he? We probably all, if we'd stop long enough to think about it, realize that God didn't give up on us. 
He presented us with Christ to reconcile us to himself. Aren't we glad that God didn't say, okay, buddy, you got three strikes and then you're out. (laughs) You're done. You've messed up. You're finished. Three strikes, I'm done with you. Refused, refused, refused. I'm I'm so glad he didn't deal with us that way. In other words, we are responsible to make reconciliation happen. Getting right with God is what the emphasis here is in this passage. Let me hurry on. So, a problem arises that could go to court in a relationship. If it is possible, take the initiative to present this from happening, if possible. Now, by the way, some folks will not, help, will not work on helping being reconciled with us. There are folks who, they just got a mad, they're just mad, they're angry, they're upset, and there's nothing you can say and nothing you can do. You can try and try and try and try and try. And they're like, talk, you're talking to the hand. If that's, if that's all you get, talking to the hand. They're liable to say a whole bunch of other things to you. But we're responsible for what we do, not what they do. You cannot make, and let me remind you what I said earlier. You cannot make someone be reconciled to you. God did not make you being reconciled to him. He gave us the opportunity. He called us to that. And thankfully, as far as I look around this room, we all said yes. Even though sometimes we didn't feel like it. We weren't all all sure we really needed it initially until God really showed us our sin. Work quickly and seek to make the issue right. Do this as fast as you can lest it gets to court You lose, you wind up, according to Jesus here, you wind up in prison in that situation, in that historical context, and you are forced to pay an even more hefty fine or payment, an obligation that will probably fall on your family and or friends since you will be in prison. That's the reference Jesus is making here. It's real prison, by the way. It's a real price tag. He's not giving us an an allegory here. He's talking about make it right before it gets worse. Now, by the way, listen to this. Sometimes we have a window to make something right, and we choose to just stay mad, and we didn't make it right. And the window's gone. The window's closed. That only God can open. But here's what I know about our God. God is a God who opens doors and opens windows and gives us opportunities. But sometimes the opportunity is gone. Because we waited. We continue to have a hard heart and a mad, we're mad about something. Because it wasn't our fault. They shouldn't have treated us this way. And it caused a problem, and we didn't make we didn't get right with God first and the other person second. Reconciliation was staved off. Settle now and avoid additional sorrow and headache. Let me hurry. The longer you wait to seek reconciliation, the more severe the consequences are likely to be. Haven't we all seen that? It's kind of like an infection. Have you ever had an infection that you put off, put off, put off, put off, thinking it'll be okay, it'll be okay, and you dob some some medicine on it, some uh, mercure comb. Y'all know what mercure comb is, right? My mom used to paint me up with that stuff. I look like some Indian going down the road. Okay, you're you're dobbed up with with you know medicine and stuff, and you put off getting it really treated, really treated, really treated, and pretty soon it's it's out of control. Dr. O'Coley could talk to us about patients and people who, who put off the proper medical care. And some have lost limbs because of it. They treated it earlier. 
the limb could have been saved. So all kinds of things that happen in relationships that because it wasn't treated early, when it should have been treated, that now it's become deadly, in some cases fatal. The idea of reconciliation is to keep things from escalating. Act now. Spurgeon says it well. He says a lean settlement is better than a fat lawsuit. (laughs) Make peace with the utmost promptitude. I love that word, promptitude. It's a big word, right? Only Spurgeon would say something like that, probably. I may try to use that in a sermon sometime, promptitude. Y'all be the only ones know where it came from. It came from a Wednesday night study. Jesus' teaching should prompt us to ask ourselves some important questions. I'm going to give them to you quickly. Are we responsible for any grudges someone has against us? Are we responsible for any anger someone has against us? Are we responsible for any bitterness someone has against us? Are we responsible for any hostility someone has against us? And listen to me, you may be thinking, well, I can't think of any. My prayer for you is that God will show you. If the answer is yes, then we must do something about it. It is absolute hypocrisy to say that you are good with God, but not good with others. It's just me and you, God. You got this. I know you do. It's all good. Forget those people. He's not going to forget them any more than he forgot you. Even if you are not the angry or offended party, if you know there is a problem, Jesus says, to seek to resolve it. God, who in the ultimate is the ultimate reconciler, has called us to a reconciling mindset and a reconciling heart. Sinclair Ferguson summarizes this text of Scripture well. He said, Jesus is not telling us to hang out our dirty linen in public, but rather to deal urgently and fully with all breakdowns in fellowship before they lead to spiritual assassination. Pretty pretty plain there, pretty strong words. God has called those who have experienced the peace of God to be peacemakers insofar as they can with others. God has called those who have experienced reconciliation to be reconcilers insofar as they can with others. It requires humility. It requires reaching out and getting out of your comfort zone. Listen, there's none of us who enjoy going to somebody and saying, you know what, I have really messed up with this. I shouldn't have ever said that. I am wrong. It doesn't matter what they did. I was wrong. It's on me. It's not on you. It's on me. I don't know about you, but the times I've had to do that, I didn't enjoy that. I, I, couldn't, hardly, I couldn't hardly wait to get done with that. Try to move on. Sometimes God lengthens that encounter out a little bit. But you will joyfully discover that it is worth it. Our God is in reconciling us through through Jesus thought it was worth it. We ought to practice the very same thing. Amen. Let's pray together as we close. Father, first of all, I want to thank you that you loved me enough to reconcile me to yourself. I thank you, Father, that Jesus, when he died on the cross, 
said it is finished. All the payment had been made. There was nothing that I could do to reconcile myself to you. It required his righteousness and his righteousness alone. And Father, from the very foundation of the world, that was your plan. Lord, I can't say that I fully understand all of that. But Lord, I must tell you in my heart, I am so appreciative and thankful that you did. Lord, would you remind us this evening how important it is, at least from your perspective, that we be reconciled to others. And yes, Father, there are those who have hurt us and those who meant us harm and those who mean us harm. But Father, we're not responsible for them. We're responsible for ourselves under the leadership of your Holy Spirit. We are to be peacemakers. Father, may we, every one of us here this evening, one day when we stand before you, may you say to us, well done for doing everything that we could to make peace. Not for manipulation. Not to get the pressure off but to be right with you. Lord, would you lead each one of us by your spirit that we would be found faithful to obey you over our wishes and our desires and our wants. Lord, I'm so aware that it is only you that can bring reconciliation in relationships. So we ask you to do that in all of our lives this evening. Thank you for every person who gathered here this evening. Thank you, Father, for their faithfulness. Thank you for our dear church family. Lord, we love what we see you doing. And Lord, I'm sure there's many things you're doing we don't see. So we give you praise and glory for even what is, what is unseen at this point. Lord, we pray for revival. Lord, we so want to see your spirit at work in this congregation. We want to see lives changed. We want to see people transformed. We want to see relationships restored. And Lord, we, we say to you that unless you do it, it won't happen. So we lay before you our lives, your church, your people, your resources to do what only you can do. First, in the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus, we pray. Amen.